think this is our seventh or eighth show so far. We've got it down, so when you hear something that sounds sincere, it's not. That's <laughs> true. But here's how we've been beginning each of these shows, so let's see if we can start with this. <laughs> This is your life, a program for all America. And now here he is, Mr. This is your life himself, Ralph Edwards. <laughs> you notice he kind of looks like this guy. That particular Ralph Edwards looks very much like Gene Gerard. <laughs> so given that this is just in the couple weeks after Paul's 80th, so we're beginning with a very early photo which Paul calls Rescuing the world for democracy. It was called saving. Oh, saving the world yeah. for democracy. It was actually taken during the Second World War, and Paul was maybe five years old, and uh, here he is in North Dakota, on the banks of which river? I can. The Red River. Oh. Yeah. Dividing line between Dakotas and uh, one of the Dakotas and Minnesota, Minnesota. And let's go forward now. We're going to see that. In, in, a, in amongst the rest of his brothers, Paul is actually the baby of the family, and uh, here he is, uh, young Paul, sitting on his brother Ted's lap. Ted, Ted was the oldest brother. He turned out to be a psychoanalyst. Very handy for this family. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know some of these stories. <laughs> and here they are again. And Ted is standing on the far left. I took this photo maybe 12, 13 years ago. Yeah. And Paul is the last remaining brother of this doormat yeah. generation. Those three then are past. But I have uh, sweaters from all three of them. <laughs> However, I didn't wear any of them tonight. I should have, really. Hmm. I think Ted could have something to say about that. Could. And here Paul is with his father, the Reverend Dorpat. Uh, a number of years ago, I spoke with one of uh, Paul's dad's parishioners who had heard Paul on the radio, and she said it was an astonishing uh, moment when I, when I was listening to the sound of, my, of Reverend Dorpat's voice. And then I realized it was Paul. So there are no recordings extant. I think they burned up in the church, your dad's church in Spokane. They burned up, yeah. But if you want to know how, what the reverend sounded like, it was a lot like Paul. I'd love to hear a tape from his old preaching because he was a hell of a preacher. He didn't have much to say, but he could really say it well. <laughs> and we don't want to forget his mom, Cherry Dorpat. Yeah. To the side. They were good parents. I loved them both. So we, we advance along through the 60s, and Paul has had a number of experiences. But many of them led to this moment founding the Helix and, uh, and then serving as its editor. And I have to tell you, as a 10-year-old at the time, I used many Helix posters to Ooh. offend my mother. <laughs> so of course, out of the Helix, Paul became a concert promoter and, and uh, many of you will, many of you actually will remember the Sky River Festival. <laughs> so, of course, the Sky River Festival often became known. Well, here's Paul in his saffron robe with Tom Robbins at, the, at Sky River. How many of you know who Tom Robbins is? Raise your hand. Turn your flashlights on now. And then we're going to move forward. Oh, and this is the, I, uh, and I, 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 first I have to apologize for using a word that Paul hates, but this oh. is an iconic photo of Sky River. Look, uh, I can, I, I do this often, I just give him a little, here he goes there. Because it was also called Mud River. It rained a lot. Yeah. Well, several months before he started his column in, uh, on January 17th, 1982, Paul actually produced 294 glimpses of historic Seattle, its neighborhoods and neighborhood businesses, and he sold it for a penny a photo, it's 294 cents for this book. And you sold how many copies? 30, 40, We claim 40,000. 40,000. Because you see, when you order them from the printer, 
you you usually order you know ten thousand. But this thing was so popular because there's nothing like it before it, and uh, it just worked out wonderfully. So we sold forty thousand of them. I don't think there's any left. Any of you got this book? Any? Raise your hand. Oh, look, several people do. Yeah. Several do. If you don't want it, please bring it back to me. <laughs> so within a few months of, of this book coming out and being sold, uh, Paul started his, his Seattle Times column. And in the process of doing the Times column, he, he found a, actually before then, he found a wonderful fellow as his mentor. And many of you may remember Marie Morgan. Okay, raise your hands if you remember Murray Morgan. How many of you have read a book of Murray Morgan's? Raise your hands. Yeah, uh, how many have read Skid Road? Oh, we have. Okay, that's good. It's just, it's, re it's, it's, it's up in print, new print again. So it's never gone out of print, but they just reprinted it. What a wonderful book. What a wonderfully written book. Go out and read it a second time. And throughout After you've bought four of our volumes, because you'll need one for yourself, one for your children, one for your parents, one for your neighbor. Anything else? You can no, that's it. All right. For your dog. No, no, Gene, come on. That, that trivializes the significance of your album. No, no. Well, this is a wonderful, this is a photo that I threw into the show because I've always, I've always loved to see Paul in the uh, early mid 80s. And here he is looking across uh, a dining room table at yeah. Lucy Campbell Coe, who, when she was a young girl, witnessed the Seattle fire. Ooh. Ooh. Which I think is an ooh moment. I don't think there are any witnesses left. I think you, you interviewed at least four or five of them, didn't you? Four, I remember. And I was just starting, and, and they were all 90 or more like Lucy. She was quite a wonderful person. There we are, you and I, Gene. There we are. We jumped to 2011. We did a show at Mohai together, and I'd been working with Paul. We already brought out a book four years before called Washington Then and Now, done for an out-of-state publisher. And so we assembled our collection of uh, current then and nows, now and thens, and uh, Mohai gave us a big room, and we brought our friend Berenger over, who took this photo from Paris, and she filled the foyer with Paris now and then photos. So here's Berenger and the two of us. And a few years before we did the Mohai show, we visited Berenger in Paris. So here's the photo that Berenger took. And we, you know, after this event, we were, we were pretty curious as to who this guy was. And it took her maybe four or five years to track him down. It turns out he was a Romanian Orthodox priest <laughs> in Paris. And here he is having just received an award for uh, his parish. His parish for the, the sensitive redecoration that was done inside. The book has been organized. We've got about 100 subjects. And we organized them arbitrarily according to the, chronologically, the date they appeared in the column. And so we start, the very first page of the book begins with Paul's first column, which was January 17th of 82. And this is the 1919 homecoming of the 63rd Coastal Artillery and the great celebration in the heart of Seattle. And of course, you'll recognize as we go forward that corner, which is Pike and Forth. This is Westlake. And this I retook on the 21st of January, 2017, the largest march in Seattle history. How many of you went to the march? Raise your hands. Ooh, well, that's a large, good, good a sample. How come you didn't go? <laughs> that's all right, you're forgiven. Go okay. ahead. And there's the original photo that Paul took in the column with a, with a handsome barista off to one side holding the, oh. a copy of the original. So there is our first layout in the book. And we go from there. 1880. That's the deepest snow in Seattle's history. How deep did it get, Gene? Well, over about eight days, it snowed 68 inches. And this was taken from the corner 
of first and cherry. And I went back and we, we haven't had a snow quite that deep for quite a while now. And we've never had a snow that deep, but I went back when it was snowing and I took flakes at first and cherry. <coughs> do you want to apologize for that or I not? I do, I apologize for our lack of snow. I have to say that what I tried to do in, over the last couple of years is to find something that would in some way reference or, or coincide or even match the historical photo. And a couple times I came close. Let's go forward. Okay. This is a lovely photo taken by the great uh, Norwegian photographer Anders Vilsa uh, at the foot of Pike Street in the late 1890s. And uh, Vilsa, uh, after spending less than a decade in Seattle, went back to Norway. And Paul tells the story of his, of his wife. Well, his wife went first. And then they agreed that he would come and join her, which he did. And then she refused to return to him to Seattle. She made him stay with her there in Norway. So that was the end of his time in Seattle, which lasted about nine years. But it was a good decision. His wife was right, as they usually are. And uh, what happened, Gene? Well, he returned to Norway and became the great uh, Norwegian living treasure until in about 1940. He was, a, he was a major photographer in Norway. And the photographs he took on the streets of Seattle sort of are, they, you can see the germination of, of this extraordinary talent. So I went back to this location, and let's see if we can, here we are, right about the fountain. Now that really happens to be also Gene's favorite subject, or one of his favorite subjects. Those are kids that go to the school where he teaches, Hillside School in, in the town of Bellevue, Washington. Some of you heard of it. So this is another Anders Vilsa photo uh, <laughs> looking at, uh, with his back to Columbia Street, and uh, <clears throat> he's looking along north along Railroad Avenue, and this is a waterfront gold rush scene, probably 1898, might be 99. Um, the flooring here isn't solid ground, but very worn planking, and if you look up here, you can see aluminum houses weighing only 150 pounds for sale to those traveling to the Yukon. And they would, with some strength and alacrity, they could hoist them on their back. And, and in that winter and spring of 98, 107 ships sailed for the Klondike. And there we are today. That's the Marion Street overpass where you go uh, underneath the, that doomed structure called the, well, what is the name of that doomed structure? That's right, okay, all of those who are in favor of it being destroyed, raise your hands. All of those who wish to keep it, raise your hands. <laughs> sort of about even divide. I, well, there's a lot of undecideds here. I have limited Paul to five votes tonight. <laughs> I think we've done... How many have we done? I think we've done three so far. Okay. okay. Now, I would like to know, and this is not a question, this, this is, doesn't relate at all to my five, but I would like to know, where in the hell does he think he comes from, telling me how many times I can ask for a vote? <laughs> Let me know that, okay? I'll just pull your mic. <laughs> oh. The power of the mic. That's right. Okay. Oh. So Anders Vilsa was celebrated recently in a series of stamps in Norway. And if you get a chance, just do a quick search of his name because he really did some spectacular portraits of, of people throughout the country. And, and, uh, and I love this photo. I just think it's gorgeous. So now, this is our Smith Tower view. And it, it was taken about a year before the tower opened. So this is Frank Noel, who climbed up uh, to the top of the Smith Tower observation deck before it was finished and shot through the girders looking across Seattle. And this perspective had never been seen from this location. So for the first time from 2nd Avenue, and you can see this, there's obviously Queen Anne, there's like Union, there's our Wallingford in the distance. And what I want you to watch now is right here, there's the Methodist 
church, and here's Rainier, right in the center, there's the Rainier Club. So keep your eyes on the Rainier Club, and, we'll, and then you can look on the outskirts and, and see if you can find Lake Union today. Watch, this, watch the Rainier Club again, and then you'll see what's grown up around it. <laughs> One thing that working on this book has, has, has done for us is it's certainly give us, given me in particular a sense over the last couple of years of how quickly uh, the city's changing, how fast the landscape's moving, uh, and how important it is to, to document. And I found myself going back four, sometimes five times to locations because it was changing so quickly and I wanted to get the last evocation before the, our, our final publication date. Well, this is the Monongahela escaping from Lake Union out from under the rapidly com completing George Washington Memorial Bridge. And uh, this foremaster had been in the lake for several years. It was already outdated. And when it left Lake Union, it ended up being sold off to a Vancouver Coover logging company, it survived a few more years hauling logs before it was scrapped. And today, we see our lovely structure. But there's more to be said about the Aurora Bridge or the George Washington Memorial Bridge. And it starts with this telegraph key. And in 1909, President William Howard Taft was given this key by George Carmack, the man who first discovered gold in the Yukon Territories. The key was made of solid gold and adorned with 22 solid gold nuggets. And you can see them all around the outside here. It's now in the Smithsonian, it's called the Taft Key. And the reason we bring it up is because it's connected to our story of the opening of the George Washington Memorial Bridge. This is February 22nd, 1932. Huge crowds, thousands were waiting on the north and the south side of the Aurora Bridge. And they were listening to uh, a politician named Roland Hartley was bitterly opposed, he was the governor. He was bitterly opposed to the Aurora Bridge. He had big problems with funding of highways and, and, and uh, why was this, Paul? Why was he such an ass? Well, we speculated it was from, well, he was from Everett. <laughs> I don't know if it had anything to do with it. Governor Hartley was, after long uh, objecting to the use of, of state monies to build this bridge or to build any, you know, uh, to work on the highways, he stood and took full credit for it in a long, meandering political speech. <laughs> And uh, the crowds, as they listened, he went on and on, and at, but at 2.57, uh, Herbert Hoover pressed the Taft key to set off the plumes of water from the fireboats below, and fireworks, and the flags unfurling, and the crowd streamed out onto the bridge, uh, cheering and interrupting Hartley's speech. That was a Republican countermanding another Republican. <laughs> so I mean, that was uh, intra frasantine and that was tough, tough. Uh, and here we are today. <laughs> the last time this, was, this uh, telegraph key was used was to open the 62 World's Fair by John F. Kennedy. And here he is pressing it to start the opening ceremonies of of the Seattle World's Fair. The first Seattle World's Fair in 1909 was also opened by Taft using that key. And now we have a little slide of the nine millionth visitor to the Seattle World's Fair. This is Paula Dahl carrying her nine millionth sign. She won the dog. Her parents are delighted and her sister is very unhappy. <laughs> And here she is standing with her elementary school class in Issaquah. And she still has this nine million sign on her wall. <laughs> they were all impressed. Now we jump to the Seattle Fire, 1889. And 
This is one of the few photographs of the fire, looking down First Avenue at Spring. And here's the Fry Opera House, and you can just see a guy standing up on top of the fry. Everything in the foreground here burned. Paul guesses that there were so few photographs because most of the photographers were, were gathering their equipment and saving their, their negatives and their plates and their cameras. And here we are today. And in the paper, this was captioned, the hideous remains. So this actually was published in a paper? It was. It was in the Seattle Daily Press. Well, I don't know if I like you going out and doing your own research, Gene. <laughs> really, uh, what does you know, that do for me? I mean, It's funny. <laughs> this is where I benefit from Paul's memory, because this is directly from his column. <laughs> Oops. Well, let's go to this scene today. And of course, what's, what's particularly fascinating is if you look at that structure, we all know what this is. This is the Pioneer Building. We're in Pioneer Square. And of course, that's the sinking ship garage. Which well, is the sinking ship garage? Right there. You can see that that structure is the front of the, what was once there in 89, the Occidental Hotel. And it became many, many decades later, it turned into what we have now. But before it became the sinking ship garage, they replaced that triangular building of, with another hotel. And here it is. After the fire. After the fire, they rebuilt. And there you have the Pioneer Building here, and there's the Seattle Hotel here in probably 1908. And we go forward, and you can see the sad diminution of the Seattle Hotel. The one thing that was accomplished with this loss, of course, was the sense of the loss, the tragedy of the loss, which inspired any number of folks under the uh, leadership of Victor Steinbrook to save another institution, which, which we may well have lost. If we had not first lost this Seattle Hotel, uh, the Pike Place Market was next to, be, to come under threat. And uh, so, with thousands of fellow citizens, Victor Steinbrook actually led the saving of the market. They were going to replace it with hotels, apartments. condos, apartments, parking places, another sinking ship. But one aspect of this that, that Paul has often called attention to is the sensitivity involved in the architecture of the sinking ship. <laughs> and the, the basket handle arches of the merchant building behind the sinking ship garage, and of course, the sensitive architects of the sinking ship replicated that. <laughs> well, it's important to, re to recognize that the actual architects of the garage pointed this out during the struggle to stop them, and that, oh no, you don't understand us. We are actually building the garage to complement the neighborhood. <laughs> and so they were sincerely using that design as the apologia for building the thing. Well, you lose one. Now thing. you understand a little more about uh, about politics when you run into these architects mm -hmm. squabbling with each other. Go ahead, Gene. No, I did, and so we're looking at at what was saved. This is in 1907. And if we, uh, if we go there today, you can see this sort of marvelous, marvelous little street that is like a touchstone. I think as, again, as the city changes so radically and so quickly around us, there are certain places that we can go and mm. find and measure ourselves against. And one of them, for me, is, is the market, and I think for many other people too. Yeah, did you say touchstone? It is a yeah. touchstone. You probably know where we are now. Oh. This is in the mid-50s, taken by Werner Lengenhager. <laughs> and he was a Boeing engineer with a camera, and he wandered around. He knew that this was coming, so he wandered around these, these alleys. How many of you are here for the building of the freeway? One, two, three, four, five. 
Six, seven, Quite eight, nine, 10, 11. 20, there's a lot that of many? that. Oh, okay. yeah. Easy. Yeah. So here we are. This is a spot where if you wanted to meet someone here, you'd say, meet me at the steps. And after about 60 years, those steps, which were made of chuckanut sandstone, were so befouled with pigeon poop that, and stained that the, uh, the, city, the city planners decided they had to replace it with something impervious and much lovelier. It would have been the federal planner, really. Federal planner? Well, let's take a look. It's the post office at Third and Union. <laughs> Mm hmm. Here we have about 250 of 500 houses of shacks at Hooverville. And this was taken originally from the uh, third, fourth floor rooftop of the B.F. Goodrich building. And there is no B.F. Goodrich building there today. So watch Smith Tower. The Port of Seattle let me get up on a hoist, and I went up 35, 40 feet in the air and retook it. But watch Smith Tower as it disappears and reappears. turning back into a port. Talk about this photo. Is it a trolley car or a street car? Oh. Well, we're gonna take a vote again. This, I got two more votes to go, don't I? And this is the <laughs> second right. of the... All right, so do you call this a, a trolley or a street car? Let's all those in, of, uh, in favor of trolley, raise your hand. So the trolley... Raise your hand higher, it. please. All those in favor of street car, please raise your hand. Oh, street car Street wins. car wins. Now, Gene's going to tell us which is correct. Well, we've been told by the Streetcar Association that the streetcar is correct, yeah. But this was taken in the early 40s by a streetcar driver who was also a photographer, and he was documenting the end of these streetcars because they were about to be replaced by buses with tires and gasoline engines. And all of those, unlike San Francisco, we, we got rid of most of ours. And today, we're back at the corner of, oh, I, sh I forgot to give the trigger warning. <laughs> this is, we're back at the corner of Fremont and 34th, and there are no trolleys in this photo. That was the trigger I wanted to warn you that you, uh, it's a wonderful city we live in. <laughs> wonderful place. Yeah. This is a, uh, the Go Hing celebration in 1921 in, uh, in the International District in Chinatown. And you can see behind here this kind of marvelous lion dancer. And it was a, 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 a six-day festivity, that, a festival that went on. Uh, and this was captured on King. And I went back and found, uh, right near the Hotel Milwaukee, a couple doors down, the Seattle Kung Fu Club, which is led by, and has been since 1960, by Sifu John Leong. And he brought his students out with all their lion dancing costumes and parked in the middle of King. And here he is today. <laughs> and there's John Leong. And he, too, is 80 years old this year. And I felt, we felt, I was a little worried that we were taking up the street, but this guy's a West Seattle cop, and he said, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, where are we here, guys? Yes. Go ahead. Gene, did somebody get it? They did. Black River? There, right in the back. Where are you? We've got a couple folks. Because well, what we do is, you know. if no one guesses, we just fade to black. <laughs> And here it is today. It's a kind of a pun, I guess. Now, the Black River disappeared mostly after the lowering of Lake Washington uh, by about nine feet. And uh, we, of course, lowered Lake Washington so that it was about the same level as Lake Union. And we can then have a build our locks and, and head from Lake Washington through Lake Union all the way out through the Ship Canal through the locks and into the sound. The Black That's River. That's where you'd be lowered, see? <laughs> to the level of uh, Puget Sound. The Black River, uh, by and large, disappeared. And 
it, it bubbles up in culverts and there's a park in Renton where you can see a little, a little piece of it, but for the most part, it's gone. It's not flowing there, is it? In, in Renton, uh, it's just lying there, is it? I, I think that it depends on the, on, on the amount of rain. I think precipitation increases. The, what happens then? It, it burbles up. We see little, little bits sort of, of a swamp, wetland little phenomenon. Little wetland, yeah. Oh, okay. So here we are in Lake Union. It's called the junction, actually. The junction. You go Renton. south, uh, yeah. Tuckwilla. You got it. Yes. Okay. So here's the. Uh, the, the children of the Brown family. And these are the faces that sold another, oh, what, 50,000 books for Paul? I think this was Yeah, that was, a, that was what kept us alive, yeah. This was on the cover of his And you're going to do the same now for Gene and his family. <laughs> when you buy several copies of, what's the name of the book, Gene? I forgot. But this is Tia and Liana <laughs> Owen, uh, my neighbor children. It's a photo they took for the Mohai show we did in 2011 and I brought them back earlier this year just for fun. You can see how they've changed in six years. Oh. <laughs> you always get that reaction with the Kalakala. How many riders on the Kalakala? How many of you have ridden on the Kalakala? Well, this was a passage from uh, most likely a, a, a repair job in Lake Union back out to the Sound, and they filled up the decks with passengers, and you can see them in the windows of the Kalakala being towed through the locks. And I knew I had to go back and find some kind of equivalency there, and I, I kind of lucked out. And it was an inadvertent luck out, because I went back in the spring of 2017, and they were bringing another boat through. And it turns out that this is the USS Turner Joy which is a Bremerton Museum ship. And after I took the photo, long after, I came to understand that it was involved in a major incident in US history. It was the second destroyer to be involved, uh, to, to go to the aid of the USS Maddox in the Gulf of Tonkin. And on August 2nd, 1964, uh, the Maddox was involved in a skirmish with North Vietnamese gunboats, and the, then there was a mythical second skirmish, which evidently never occurred, but upon which Lyndon Johnson got us into the war. And the Turner Joy was, was, uh, was one of the two ships that were most involved. And there's something that Clay Eels, our editor, took a couple days ago of looks in front like Salties. A, looks like a Danish cow. It does kind of, <laughs> with three eyes. So here, here at uh, the, the wheelhouse of the Kalakala still uh, sits now in front of Salties. That's about all that's left. This is, and then he took it through looking at the sky. We're getting closer to the to things that will soon disappear. And here's one of them. This is in April, uh, not, not long before the opening of the viaduct. And someone pointed out that, it, that the concrete, the structure actually looks already, it looks a little bit uh, soiled and abused. And no car has traveled on it at this point. But we have these lovely models walking along. We don't know that they were models. You mean, oh, I mean, you mean generally in the sense of models. Yeah. yeah, okay. And today, and here's where I want to call, so this is our skyline looking about the same spot, but today I want to call attention to, you can see the Smith Tower, but here is the F5 building, at that, as it was being constructed, called the Mark. And the Seattle developer who encouraged the, the building of this building, his name was Kevin Daniels, and he went to ZGF Architects. And in trying to articulate the qualities he wanted in a structure, he kept coming back to Breakfast at Tiffany's and Audrey Hepburn. So if you look now, look at the, look at the lines in the F5 building. This sits up above the, uh, the Methodist Church. And both Paul and I kind of 
like this building, and we we discovered this story only a few weeks we ago. We love it, Gene. We, we love do. it. We really love it. <laughs> the sensitivity that was not present in the sinking ship garage is so. Here's the model for this building. <laughs> and while they were while they were, it was under construction. They actually had a large uh, poster of Audrey Hepburn, and you can see that her angles and her cigarette holder in a certain sense, reflect. <laughs> you'll, you'll never think of that differently now, will you? <laughs> no, that's it. There's Audrey right there on the Seattle skyline. Yeah. So Was there did. a melody in Breakfast with so, so, Tiffany? Do you remember any, anybody remember a song from Breakfast? What is it? Moon River. Moon River. Water than a tongue. Yeah, lovely. This, oh, this photo was taken of Green Lake in 1903 by Ashel Curtis. And much has changed. You can't see it. This is uh, a significant photo. It was given to Paul by a significant Seattle figure. And it is actually the oldest structure still standing in Seattle. Unmarked. And this is the mother of the fellow that gave the photo to Paul. I was introduced to Ivor Hagelin to help him decorate the acres of clams in the early 80s when he had re, uh, when he, when he had done it over again, you know. So I went down there and Jim Faber was the friend who introduced us. And Jim Faber had been one of his best hucksters, one of his funniest carry-ons, the guy that he worked with a lot. And so he gave me that photo to copy for the Ivor Archive, which I assembled over the last few years. And I'm about to write pretty soon, and Gene's going to laugh at this because he knows I've said this before, but I'm going to write a book called The Illustrated Ivor. So it'll be a lot of pictures with captions and also running text. So look the, for that next year. The history of this oldest house is that it was built by Doc Maynard in the 1860s when he moved to West Seattle, traded his acreage in down, what is now downtown Seattle, left the other settlers behind, and went to West Seattle and tried to start a farm. I completely missed that part of the story, didn't I? You did. And <laughs> nearly starved to death with his wife, Catherine. Was not a great farmer. But this is the house that he built, Jeez, and it was uh, near the waterfront, and they moved it about a block up on 64th, and you can still see it to this day. And here are members of the Southwest Historical Seattle. And there is Clay Eels. Where's Clay? He's Where in is the he? picture. Where in the picture? He's on the far left. Far left. Yeah, distinguishing himself by a polar position. That's right. Down at the end of the street, they have a little plaque, but it doesn't actually direct you to the house itself. So if you want to see this very old structure, which is surprising because it's entirely made of wood and is not rotted away. And I, I posit, having seen some of these structures that were built in the 1890s, that Douglas fir actually lasts a long time when you're at the heart of the tree. Hmm. It really does. Here we are looking at Princess Angeline on her front porch somewhere below uh, Western and it was, uh, it was not known exactly where that was until Ron Edge, who's been a participant in the column for many years and a researcher, and he actually triangulated uh, using a number of photographs and roof lines and tree stumps and uh, comparing them all. He found pretty, he thinks he found the location where this shack was. And so we went down last year and I retook the photo with Ron sitting right about where Princess Angeline is sitting on her front porch. And what I appreciate about this photo is that it's the one green patch remaining between uh, Western Avenue and the waterfront. And on the left side is the Pike Place Market parking garage, and on the right side is the Fix the Door building. 
and going all the way up this incline are bamboo shoots, uh, which just uh, have filled up the entire uh, path here. And the, the residents of the, um, of the Fix Medora use this as kind of their outdoor playground. And it's, but it's, it's closed off. To Don't place. trip. Okay. So. This is about the end of the show, I think. We're, We're coming very there. close. Those of you, would you like to take a stretch now for the last 30 seconds? <laughs> no, okay. So here we have Princess Angeline, or Kiki Soblu, once again, the daughter of Chief Seattle and an inset of Chief Seattle himself. She's sitting on the corner of what is now uh, Post Avenue and, uh, and First uh, in what is now the market. Well, not quite First. But well, they can see in the photo and we're gonna go Yeah, there. that's First Avenue behind her. First Avenue behind her, yeah. okay. All right, here we go. What I'm gonna show you now are two of the direct descendants of both of them. On same the, place. Same spot. On the left is Mary Lou Slaughter, who is the great, 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 great granddaughter of Kiki Sobu. That's right. And to the right is Ken Workman, who is the great, 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 great grandson right. of Chief Seattle through his second wife. And Mary Lou is a remarkable cedar uh, weaver and makes, makes uh, hats and shawls and baskets. And uh, these are a couple of them that she made for, for uh, Ken and her posing. The, um, they look like they're from Central Casting. They're I know so they do. Ken you know. looks like, a, like the George Clooney version. George Clooney played Ken Workman. Mary Lou is 80 years old. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> She's as old as I am. Now, while we were taking this picture, uh, Ken turned around a couple of times, and, uh, and Clay took a picture of me taking a picture of Ken and Mary Lou. And we spent maybe 10 minutes taking a series of shots in different positions and taking hats on and off. And, and I saw Ken jerk around a couple of times. And afterwards I said, Ken, what, what were you doing? He said, well, I don't know, but someone was tapping me on the elbow. And I said, well, there's no one behind you. And he says, well, I can't explain it. I thought they were trying to pick my pocket. <laughs> and so I think of this as those, the nudge of history, the skeptic that I am. Paul thinks of it as BS, but I... <laughs> it's true. I think of it as... No, I don't, true, I don't take the nudge as BS, but the interpretation, the ghost story, BS. Did I say a ghost? No, but that's really what you're implying. No. <laughs> Well, I, I'm happy to let, uh, let Ken have his experiences. Well, I am too, I am too. Oh, well, never did we, we didn't act this way in front of Ken, did we? Well, you weren't there. No, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was behind Clay taking a picture of Clay, taking a picture of you, taking a picture of Ken. Actually, I think Paul was the one who was trying to pick Ken's pocket. And it could have been, yeah. All right, so there's the, the back cover of our book, and that's, that's the end of the show. Thank you all for coming. Oh.